Let's begin with prayer. Father God, I thank you for your amazing grace, for your love, the firmest of foundations. Your love is true. You do love us. Thank you, Father, for your love. And I pray, Lord, the deception of the evil one will be rooted out and the truth of who you are will be revealed in our hearts and minds. We crush the enemy in Jesus' name, and I repent and confess our sins that we would find our hope and healing in you, for you are good. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here are some statements about how initial inventions have been viewed and rejected when they were originally, come, uh, originally represented. Uh, this is a 1920, 1921 New York Times editorial about Robert Goddard's revolutionary rocket work. He says, Professor Goddard does not know the relation between action and reaction and the need to have something better than a vacuum against which to react. He seems to lack the basic knowledge ladled out daily in high schools. And of course, Robert Goddard, uh, is ha his groundbreaking work is what produced the idea and the eventual development of actual ro rockets. Uh, drill for oil? You mean drill into the ground to try to find oil? You're crazy. This was said by drillers to Edwin Drake, whom he tried to enlist in 1859. Stocks have reached what looks like the permanently high plateau. This was said by Irving Fisher, professor of economics at Yellow University in 1929. <laughs> Marischal Ferdinand Foch, who was a professor of strategy, said, airplanes are interesting toys but of no military value. Pierre Pachette, a professor of physiology at Toulouse in 1872, said, Louis Pasteur's theory of germs is a ridiculous fiction. Sir John Eric Erickson, Britain's surgeon, British surgeon in 1873, said, The abdomen, the chest, and the brain will forever be shut from the intrusion of the wise and humane surgeon. And then Bill Gates in 1981, talking about the personal computer, said, 640K? That ought to be enough for anybody. We do terabytes now. The future. Can anyone adequately predict the future? What does the future hold? You look at our movies, and some movies show a pristine future with cities built, people getting along, war is a thing of the past. Other movies show how the world has fallen apart into a dystopian hell. Either the machines have taken over, aliens have attacked us, or deadly diseases spread over the world and zombies are everywhere. Either way, we killed ourselves, right? <laughs> I tell you the future. Let me tell you the future. I'll tell you the future. There will be people who will come in the name of Christ and mislead many. There will be wars and rumors of wars, and fear will fill the hearts of many. Fear will fill the hearts of many. I'll say that a couple times. Nations will rise against nation, kingdoms against kingdom. In various places, there will be famines and earthquakes. You and your brothers and sisters will be persecuted. Some will be killed, and all of us will be hated for our faith in Christ. Many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise. Lawlessness will increase, and people's love will grow cold. However, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world, and then the end will come. There's the future. The chaos that the human selfish sinful nature produces, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is the only thing that can stop it, heal it, and overwhelm it. The future of humanity is Christ. What I mean is that either you will repent of your sins and accept Christ for who he is, or you will reject him and face the consequences of his wrath. But either way, one thing is certain in Philippians 2, at the name of Jesus... Every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ will be acknowledged for who he is. He will be known for who he is. Let us make sure we declare daily, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. This is not a prediction. This is a certainty. You know, he is Lord. That's why I want to exalt his name. Don't, you don't need to know my name. Know his name. He is the name I want exalted. Again, let's take a look at what the future holds. In Revelation 4, which was read to us, we see this in verse uh, 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. 
And the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. I will show you the future. And what does he show him? So he says, come see the future. So John walks through the door. And what does he see? He sees God. He, see, he saw worshipers. The future is this. God will be worshipped. The worship of God is the future. It's today. This is the future I want to invest in. As John was talking about investments. I want to invest in that future. I want to be used by God to bring that about. This is a certainty, I, and I believe God's plan, and I know his plan will succeed. Because the future is secure in God. That means God has a plan for you. He has a plan to stop the futility that creation has been subjected to. He has a plan to set free those caught in sin, whether a wall comes up or not. <laughs> he has a plan to redeem, a plan to heal, a plan to save plan to forgive. He has a plan to bring what all of humanity needs. He has done that. He has a plan to bring humanity to the throne and to worship him. And he wants you to join him in bringing this about. So I challenge all of us today. Follow his plan. Follow his plan. God, you know, listen to him and obey him. Fulfill your calling. God has given you a calling. Fulfill, his, fulfill the calling God has given you. God wants you to begin by submitting to him daily, to affirm his love for you, to stay in his word, to seek the filling of the spirit, and to be a person of prayer. As Paul wrote this letter to the Romans, he, provided the, he proved the depth of humanity's depravity and the reach that sin has in our lives and our heart. It was deadly, but he has also proven in this letter, how strong and powerful God's love is and how, sal how strong salvation is. How sin is no match for him. Forgiveness is real. Holiness is placed upon you. Righteousness given to you. The depravity that doomed us has been overcome by the blood of Christ. The deadly destination is rerouted. We can now have a different direction, a different outcome, a different life. God is offering the new life. The new creation, new hope. Why keep going in the direction that cannot be overcome by human endeavor? Paul in his letter to the Romans has shown us there is a more excellent way. There is a hope that can free us from the futility that this life brings us. Paul wanted all he came across to know there is a God in heaven who does love you. And he does want you to come to him and to know him. Follow him. He has a plan for you. Follow his plan. Live the life that brings freedom to others. Number one, find your strength in the Holy Spirit. Let's look at verse 26 of chapter 8. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to to the will of God. There was a man who asked a mail order company to send him plans for a birdhouse. Instead of sending him plans for a birdhouse, however, they sent him plans for a sailboat. He tried to put it together, but it just wouldn't work. He couldn't figure out what kind of bird would live in this. So he wrote a letter and sent the parts back to the people. They wrote a letter of an apology and added this postscript. If you think that was difficult, you should have seen the man who got your plans trying to sell a birdhouse. When you try to build your life with the wrong instructions and the wrong plans, you won't get very far. God has provided for us, for you and me, the plans we need to live this life. As we read la read last week in Proverbs, it says, Trust the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. Do not lean on your own understanding. That's a very important statement. You should remind yourself every day. I, don't, I, I should not lean on my own understanding because it's weak and limited. I'm going to lean on his understanding. God will make your path straight. He will show you the way. He, so build your life on the plans that God has for you. 
You know, as we read these verses in verse 26 and 27, we see that prayer is part of the plan. God is calling you to a life of prayer. So number one, make prayer a priority. Make prayer a priority. Yet Paul reached this conclusion because we read in verse 17, and if children, heirs of God, heirs also, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so we may also be glorified with him. If we suffer with him. We live in a world where we will suffer because we follow him, obey him, and listen to him. We will suffer because this age is evil. We suffer under the curse that God has placed over the earth and what sin has done to us. The sin has, uh, we're cursed by this sin and over people, over governments, over all creation that this curse is affected. We suffer because of the futility in which this earth is subjected. All of creation is a slave to corruption. What is corruption? It is something that degrades over time. It falls apart. Creation is falling apart under the curse of sin. Because of that, as followers of Christ, we see the corruption of humanity, the sinful decisions, the tyranny of others, the hurting and violence toward one another. Uh, There's people filled with hate. There's decisions that are made uh, to bring pain to one another. Immorality is forced upon us. We suffer as we see the lives of people dying, struggling, canceled, and controlled. We see people as Christ saw them. We must see them as Christ sees them. In Matthew 9, it says, Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. We must see the world as lost, dying, struggling under the weight of sin and curse. And and regardless if they have it all together, they're distressed and dispirited because they have no shepherd. They're, what does that mean, they're, they're without a shepherd? That means they're easy prey to the enemy. And the enemy will seek to devour them. Because of that, the compassion of God fills our hearts, and we fall before God, and we weep for them. We feel the weight of sin upon those around us. It burdens us, so we pray. And sometimes we don't know how to pray. So we're called to pray. Also, we face the suffering of persecution and the temptations we endure. We face the poor decisions around us that can affect us we endure the difficulties of the immoralities that surround us we are too are burdened by the weight of sin and that surround us and at times we want to participate in that sin so we pray we pray we're called to pray that's why in verse 25 of 8 it says we are to persevere we persevere through prayer when we pray we do not know how to pray at times in the confusion and the chaos that surrounds us due to the sinful actions of others it is, and that and the things that we have to wade through we have to cry out to god it's difficult to know how to proceed help me lord so we pray even in the midst of all that we see and go through the holy spirit is there in the midst of your burdens and difficulties you come to god in weakness and say lord i don't know how to pray help me lord I don't even know the words. As I see all the stuff happening around me, as I see the things happening to me, as I see the evil, and it looks like you're losing. What this means is I can't always see God's plan. I get lost in it, in the things that are happening. I can't see what you're doing. I I can't understand how this will work. In Hebrews, it says, but now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. It's being subjected to Christ. It's like, does it look like it? We don't see it, and we struggle to see it. At times, we become like Elijah when he felt defeated and in despair. In First Kings, it says, I've been very zealous for the Lord, uh, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel are forsaken your covenant, tore down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I'm all alone left, and they seek my life to take it away. It's all gone, Lord. The whole thing's falling apart. Your whole, all your people are forsaking you, and I'm it. That's all you got. <laughs> I feel defeated. You lost, God. In the book of Habakkuk, the prophet complained to God, How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not say. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. Won't you do something, God? You're losing, God. You will, your will is denied. The message rejected. The enemy's winning. Your plans are crumbling. 
There are times we feel that way. It looks like it. Do something, God. Help out. Help me. And as we come before the old, holy, awesome God, we groan and our spirit picks us up. The Holy Spirit picks us up. We're weak and we need his help. God, help me. We come to the Father and cry out. And then we read those beautiful words, the Spirit intercedes for us. The Holy Spirit is speaking on your behalf. He gives you the words to pray. He does this by reminding you of his will. To intercede means to speak on your behalf, to speak for you. That is one of the most Christ-like ways we can help others is to intercede for them. Lord, this person is a sinner. This person is struggling. This person is dying. Please, Lord, save them. Heal them. There are times we want to say, Lord, punish them. (laughs) Don't do that. (laughs) Lord, save them. (laughs) He speaks for you. He becomes your voice. This is the Holy Spirit acting out his name of counselor, advocate, comforter, the one who stands beside you the one who speaks for you, the one who gives you a voice, the Holy Spirit's interceding for you. Isn't that amazing? He's thinking of you and speaking for you. He's helping you to pray. He's guiding you to all truth. He's reminding you of what Christ said. He's fulfilling everything that Christ promised about the Spirit. What this teaches is that God's plan is not masked by the immorality and the violence of this evil age, but rather his plan is forming and working through you and me. He is accomplishing it through you and me. We may not see it on the the news or read about it, but he is working and he's doing the work through us. These verses tell us that we rely on God to pray. What the gospel has taught us is that we rely on Christ to save us. We rely on God to forgive us. We rely on the Spirit to enable us. We rely on God to compel us. We simply rely on God even to pray. Rely on God, relinquish your rights and control, submit to him completely, seek the spirit, cry out, Abba, Father, and follow his plan. Number two, know God, get, know that God, know God gets the final say. I like that. He gets the final say. Maybe I should have said know that God gets the final say. I don't know. Let's look at verse 28, a very well-known verse. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. My wife and my daughter and uh, Micah and I moved to New York in January of 1993, 30 years ago, wow. We moved there so I could attend seminary and Ken would finish college, he had two years left. And we get settled in, I find a job, and when I was living there, I listened to the radio a lot. And I remember in those days, very distinctly, a commercial about an investment opportunity. The way they played this up was amazing. You wanted to invest in this thing. This investment opportunity was called Sports Dog. It was a restaurant that sold hot dogs with anything you wanted on it. With, and also they would sell you framed pictures of sports legends, both past and current. Well, the way it was billed, you know, it's, it's kind of silly as you look back on it now. This was the next McDonald's. Getting in now while you can. I remember taking Cam and my daughter Micah to Sports Dog, and I just remember the guy trying to upsell us on our hot dog. And as you can imagine this franchise, the idea obviously did not pan out. Have you heard of Sports Dog like McDonald's? It's just a distant memory because in the end, you're buying a hot dog. (laughs) Now, some of the best hot dogs I had was in New York City, those vendors. uh, Oh, man, that was some good stuff. The plan, though, was for this restaurant to be very successful, but it didn't pan out. I lived in New York for a little over three years, and by year two, there was no mention on the radio of sports dog. They all went belly up. You say pork belly up, I guess. That's right. The plans of man may be frustrated and not become what was desired. But in Isaiah, we read this, Isaiah 14. For the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? Let's again look at the future. What does the future hold? In Daniel, we read this verse. 
In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it, itself, but it will itself endure forever. What does this verse tell us? All the kingdoms that are built by us, by human beings, all of our kingdoms have no future. God's kingdom is the future. In Revelation 17 through 21, we have the tell of two cities. The one city built by humanity on the passion of sin that humanity celebrates is destroyed. It has no future. But the city, the one in Revelation 21, where God is the center, that has a future. I want to invest my life in the th sure thing. So I want to put God in the center of my life. I want him to be the center because he's a sure thing. If God is not worshipped, then that plan will fail. When you pray and you're struggling, the Holy Spirit will intercede, speak for you. The Holy Spirit will remind you of God's will. What he will also remind you is that God gets the final say. So follow his plan. Number one, trust God to work it out. This is uh, verse 820, 828 is a well-known verse. It's kind of like uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, uh, which is repeated many times. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Beautiful verse. A lot like Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. These are all good verses to remind ourselves and remember of God's promises. But this verse in Romans 8.28 is not about a, a verse of trying harder or trying to make something happen by your strength or white-knuckling it. This verse is in the context of the praying that you're doing in verses 26 and 27. This is the place the Holy Spirit brings you when you're groaning and struggling in prayer. He brings you to the sovereignty of God. He brings you to the omnipotence of God. He brings you to the certainty of who God is. The Spirit brings you to the place of peace. You can rest assured in his sovereignty. God has this under control. I will trust God to work this out. I will follow his plan. When you look at this verse, the first thing you want to recognize is that God is working to make things good. Because that is who he is. God created this world and he saw that it was good. He made the world good. He is good and so he will only seek what is good. To make things good means to oppose those things that are not good. And what is not good is against his word. What is not good? That which is not according to his plan. We do as a human race, the kingdoms we have built are not good because they don't begin with, God, you're holy, and we worship you. Instead, there, I am better and stronger than over there. It all starts with us. God is to be worshipped. The heart is deceitful above all else. There is no cure. It is beyond help. When we create a path or build a structure, or create a government, it is not according to God's plan because he's not worshipped. So build your life on worshipping God. But when you read this verse, you realize God is not talking about the human, humanity generally, but to his people specifically. He's talking to the church. God is not working in government to fulfill his plan or the powerful. He's using his church to fulfill his plan. God is working to make all things good to those who love God. God is working through you and me as we face the turmoil of this evil age and the temptation it brings. We see one very important truth, that evil, sin, death, all have an expiration date. Those things, evil, sin, and death, are temporary. I'm reminded of Jacob's sons who had conspired together to get rid of Joseph because Joseph was the favored son of Jacob. If you have children, it's not a good idea to favor one child over another. But Jacob did. He favored Joseph over the others. And, of course, Joseph would make sure everybody knew that. Look at this coat I got. Isn't this nice, you know? And they just hated him. <clears throat> and it's interesting because in Genesis uh, 37, the name Joseph means to add. Because Rachel says, may, I have a, may God add another son to me, Joseph. It's interesting because it says Jacob's love was added upon him, and it says the brother's hatred was added upon him. So there's a little play on his words. 
but they just hated him. So they conspired to get rid of him. And what they did is they ended up selling Joseph to the Egyptians as a slave. He was a slave to Potiphar, the captain of the guard, until he was ousted out by the wife. He was sent to jail where he served as second in command. He was then asked to interpret a dream uh, to Pharaoh. He interprets the dream. He's then elevated to second in command to Pharaoh. Joseph stockpiles food so when the famine hits, people from all over the world can then come and buy food. Joseph's brothers eventually come to see uh, Joseph. Uh, and of course, they don't recognize him. They buy him food. And through a series of events and tricks, Joseph eventually reveals himself to who his brothers. Um, and they have a wonderful reunion. And then he has a wonderful reunion with his dad, Jacob. Then several years later, Jacob dies. After Jacob dies, the brothers start to worry and say, I wonder if now Joseph's going to really fully get his revenge on us for selling him as a slave. And so they came up to him and says, oh, by the way, dad said not to punish us. This is my version. And so he's, he, this is what he says in Genesis 50. Do not be afraid, for I am in God's place. For am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. What 828 tells us is this. Yes, we will face evil. We will face the problems and struggles of this evil age, but God overcomes evil. Evil may do its thing, but it will never win. Its purpose will and its will will never be fulfilled. God sees the evil and he turns it around to fulfill what he wants. The perfect example is the, the, the crucifixion is the perfect example of this. Christ was arrested because of jealousy and envy. He was taken and beaten, sentenced to die for no real charges. He didn't do anything wrong. He was crucified on the cross. He, he died. He was mocked. He was hated. He was buried. And God took the sinful, violent actions of man, and he used it to bring salvation for you and me. He used the evil intentions of the human heart where nothing good resides, sending Christ to the cross. He died a brutal death, but then he arose. The evil of man was used to bring something good. Evil cannot stop what God's going to accomplish. Look at the last part of that verse. Called according to his purpose, his plan. God will use the evil we endure to accomplish his purpose. His plan cannot be thwarted. His will cannot be stopped. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray. We believe in you. We trust you. We follow. We want to follow your plan. Because it's a sure thing. And number three, rejoice in the direction you're headed. Look at verse 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he justified. And those whom he justified, he glorified. As I read 828, I'm reminded of 2 Corinthians. It says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God comforts you in the affliction you endure now, and now using that same comfort, you can comfort others. Think of it this way. Say you're a drug addict. And you became clean. Now use what you know about drug addiction and turn it into ministry. Help those who are in drug addiction to get out and become clean. Ooh, and Satan hates that. When you turn the thing you struggled with into a ministry, that defeats the enemy's purpose. Use the affliction you suffered to bring healing to others. That is turning evil into good. That is doing what God does. In 828, Paul wrote, according to his purpose. What is the purpose to those who are called? What is God moving us toward? It's right there in verse 29. Be conformed to the image of, of his son. Conform to Christ. Number one, conform to Christ. That's where he's leading us all to, to look and act like Christ. The goal God has for you is to conform us into the image of Christ, to treat others as Christ treated those around him, to love as he loved, to serve as he served, to see as he saw, and to give as he gave. When we read God foreknew, it means he saw what he wanted, he planned it out, he planned for you. He planned for you to know him. He planned for you to live in a way that he designed you to live. 
He saw it. He called you because he knew you. When you think of God's foreknowledge, his omniscience, by, you are declaring, God, you know all things. But beyond that, his knowledge is his love for you. I saw you, and I love you. I love you. Affirm his love every day. Never deny it. He predestined you because he loves you. He predestined you because he loves you. He saw you before the foundation of the world, and he chose you to be like his son because he loves you. Because God saw you, he has a plan for you, and his plan is Christ. The end is Christ. The future is Christ. Our hope is Christ. Our life is Christ. Our joy is Christ. God thought of you before, he, before anyone else could think of you. And now because of Christ, you get to enjoy the birthright of Christ. What does that mean? You get to know the Father. What does this image of Christ look like? An intimate relationship with the Father. It is God's love revealed. It is his words brought to life. It is a hand that heals. It is a life that brings freedom to others. In 8.30, Paul gives four words, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. God in Christ predestined you to be like his son with whom he is well pleased. He's called you to follow and serve Christ and to serve as Christ. He has justified you so that you will have the heart and mind of Christ. He has glorified, meaning he will bring you to Christ who has prepared a place for you. When you think of glorified, that is the day we go into God's presence and stand before his holy throne. We're received into his presence. When all earthly things are over, and we will, with the angels and all those strange creatures that we read about in Revelation 4, we will join in that heavenly choir and we will sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And we will never tire of it because it'll be too amazing. And you'll have no other agenda. And you'll just simply say, I don't want to go anywhere else because this is too amazing. That's glorified. God has a plan. That plan is Christ. Are you ready to follow his plan? Trust his plan? Follow his plan. Let's pray. Father, I can't thank you enough and praise you enough. For you are holy, holy, holy. You are good and awesome and true. You have justified us. You predestined us. You foreknew us. You have saved us. You've called us. You've and one day glorify us. Lord, I long to join the heavenly choir as we want to join with them right now and say, holy, 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 for you are so good. And we want to bring worship into our home, into our lives, that you are the center of our mind and heart.